Good morning, gentlemen. Let us uh, start talking about propeller behind a ship. We have seen how the propeller beha behaves in open water in the last class. What happens when you put the propeller behind a ship? First of all, as we have discussed earlier, the propeller works in the wake field of the ship. Therefore, the speed that you get, water speed falling on the propeller would be less than the ship speed or in other words, speed of advance V A will be less than V S. Am I right in saying this? That is when the propeller works behind the ship, because there is a wake we have already discussed. The speed of water that is falling onto the propeller will be less than the speed at which the ship was advancing. That is okay? okay. So, that is one effect that we have the effect of wake. Secondly, we have seen that the when the propeller was not there, the resistance of the ship was equal to the tow rope resistance. We have defined the resistance of a ship as the force required to pull the ship by means of a tow rope when the propeller is not there. Now, we have fitted the propeller. Propeller basically is a hydrodynamic device which pulls water from ahead and throws it back. Very like a, like a uh, axial fan. The water flows past the prop prop propeller impacts energy to the water. So, water flows at a higher velocity around the ship. Now, we have seen that the velocity of water is related to resistance of the ship. So, when the propeller is moving behind the ship, due to change of velocity of water in the stern part, there will be a change in the force required to push the ship forward which will be higher. In other words, the thrust that the propeller would give would not be equal to the resistance of the ship, but will have to be higher than the resistance of the ship. Can you understand that? So, T will be greater than R. That is, we say thrust effect, thrust resistance effect. Okay, thrust resistance relationship is not equal to, we had said earlier that if I provide a thrust equal to resistance, the ship will move forward. Now, what we find because of the action of the propeller, since the velocity of water near the stern will be increased, the resistance of the ship with the propeller working would be different from if the propeller was not there. Therefore, the force required to push the ship at the same speed will be higher than the resistance of the ship. Okay. So, thrust required will be higher than the resistance. Then there will be third effect that is we have seen the K T K Q versus J relationship in open water that is thrust torque rpm and speed relationship of the propeller alone. Now, we know the speed behind the ship we know at which rpm the propeller is moving. We also know, know the torque that is delivered to the propeller. Can we assume that the propeller characteristics remain same as that in open water? The answer is no. The thrust torque and propeller characteristics that is uh, thrust torque speed and rpm characteristics represented by k t k q and j would be slightly different for the behind condition 
then is the coupled wave smoking water. Okay. So, behind efficiency, behind condition efficiency is not equal to open, open efficiency. So, these will be the basically when a propeller is working behind a ship, these three will be the main effects by which propeller characteristic will change. What we will do is, we will see the effect of all of these. We will we'll try to understand all these three effects separately and see what effect does it have on propulsion characteristics of a ship and propeller combination. First thing that we we'll must see is wake. What is the cause of wake? So far, we have uh, seen that when a ship is moving in water, if I draw the ship like this, there is a boundary layer which develops around the ship and goes behind it. Right? Here, if I draw a velocity profile along the y axis, then the water velocity will be constant because there is no disturbance to flow in front of the ship or very near the front because there is no uh, boundary layer developed in the front of the ship. Right? Let us consider a submerged body, no wave effect. If I draw a velocity profile here, how will it look? The velocity will increase, will be 0 here and will increase till the boundary layer and then it will become equal to the free stream velocity. But what about at the boundary layer itself? What will happen at the boundary of the boundary layer? Will it be equal to the free stream velocity or slightly more than or slightly less than? Velocity will be more because if you recall, there will be a pressure developed due to potential flow. There is nothing to do with viscous flow. If I draw the pressure around this body, we have seen pressure will rise at the front, then drop in the middle, rise again at the aft and go like this, is not it? On a, around a streamlined body, when there is no separation. We discussed this when we discussed wave making resistance of a ship, the pressure distribution around a hull form. So, the pressure, this is pressure due to potential flow, there is no viscosity here. So, pressure will drop here and we said at that time that satisfying Bernoulli's principle, if pressure is low, the velocity will be high, it will be more than what it would be in the front. In fact, front velocity will be low. So, this will have a slightly higher velocity at the boundary layer itself and then it will reduce to free stream velocity. Is that clear? What will happen here? Hmm? Velocity will decrease. That means, here we will have free stream velocity. Right? What will happen here? Here, right? The velocity will reduce because it is in the boundary layer. The water velocity is less at the center and slowly increases to full value towards the boundary layer limit. So, you see the speed of water here is less than the free stream velocity or we can assume if you assume the ship moving in this direction v as if it's pulling a pulling an um, uh, amount of water with it am i clear the pull the the 
so the amount of water it is the velocity with which it is pulling the water is this velocity. is not it? That is actually the water would have flown at this velocity, but it is flowing at this velocity as if the additional water uh, additional velocity is a forward velocity. Do you understand? So, there is a drop in velocity due to wake, with due to boundary layer. This is one effect boundary layer or this is called viscous or frictional wake. Okay. So, this is one reason for wake, the other reason comes straight from here that there is a drop in velocity due to increase in pressure. So, this is pressure wake, right? Am I clear? Then there will be a third effect that is uh, what would happen, um, let, let me draw it, there is a ship moving with a velocity v forward. How will the wave profile look? let us say it generates transverse waves in such a manner that there is a wave crest at the front and wave crest at the back, right. And the waves travel this way in the reverse direction because the ship is going forward. What will be the velocity of water particle here? Can you tell anybody? What is the nature of movement of a water particle here? it would be circular. So, if I draw this elongated form, the particle will move like this velocity being this way. That means, at the bottom the water velocity is this way and how will this circular radius circular velocity reduce considering deep water as the water particles go down below the surface of water, this circle will reduce in diameter and after some time it will vanish and all this will have the same velocity. Do you understand? That means, if there is a crest at the stern, the water velocity will generally have a movement to the forward particle velocity. In a trough it will be just the other way, the velocity water particle will move like this. Therefore, the velocity will be backward. Now, suppose there is not a crest, but there is a trough at the this thing. I have just drawn a single wave uh, wavelength equal to ship length, but suppose it was not like that. Suppose the second wave appeared here and the trough appeared there, then a wave could have been created which would have been supporting the movement of water. So, there is a third component which is called the wave wake. So, wake has three components, one is the boundary layer effect or viscous and frictional wake, the other is the potential wake or pressure wake and the third is the wave wake. This will not occur in case of a submerged body like a submarine because there is no wake and the nature of this wake will vary if the draft depth of water was not deep. The nature of a deep water wave is quite different from that of a shallow water wave. So, this nature of the wave wake will vary. The other thing to note is that whereas, frictional wake and potential pressure wake both were providing a velocity forward, the wave wake we cannot say that it can provide forward or it can provide backward also depending on whether the crest or trough is at the stern. Is that clear? Very interesting phenomenon you can observe from here. If I had a, 
Yeah, opposing the general direction of motion of water. That means it is adding to the weight. Interesting observation. Let us consider the case of a single screw ship and a twin screw ship. Okay. Now, a single screw ship, say this is a single screw ship, this is the area of the propeller disc. Okay. I have drawn the plan. So, what we see here, the boundary layer will form there like that and the propeller is inside the boundary layer, it may be partly inside, partly outside depending on its diameter. Let us look at a twin screw ship. Your propeller is here, some sort of arrangement like this, whatever it is, but it is outside. Now, you see the effect. The geometry of the ship is such that when you put the propeller in a twin screw ship, it is away from the center line where the main wake was situated. So, it is not being affected so much by wake as the single screw ship was affected. Okay. So, in a twin screw ship, the wake effects are generally less. Okay. Next, we look at the thrust. What have we uh, said regarding thrust? Uh, we have increased the velocity. made a small sketch which I would like to show you. I have a propeller here, I am drawing the plan. The water was uh, way, way forward, far forward of the propeller disc, the water was moving at some velocity v, let me say, or v, v a, I will speed of advance, let me for the time being uh, write v. This is the propeller disc. Okay. You can imagine a very simple propeller theory, we will go to propeller theories later, but right now this so much I can say that propeller could be considered as if it is pulling this water and throwing it on the other side at a higher velocity, changing the momentum of water. Okay. Then there will be a reaction and you will get a forward thrust, very simplest of the theories I am telling you. So, then what will happen? What will that propeller do then? What will happen to the velocity and the pressure across the propeller disc? Like a pump, it would work like a pump, pulling the water and throwing it on the other side. So, the velocity will uh, be increased and same this way, right. I am only drawing half. So, if V was the velocity here, this will be or let me write V A, so that we do not confuse, we are all talking about. velocity will be increased across the disc over a distance. What will happen to pressure? How does this velocity increase? I must provide a pressure difference across the disc. So, the pressure would There will be a change in pressure at the disc itself, right. Am I understood? 
that is as if the propeller disc is providing a high pressure across itself therefore, the velocity is increasing it is pulling the pressure from one side and what is the meaning of pulling applying pressure. So, a pressure change occurs across the disc. So, because of change in velocity the pressure drops here there is a pressure change here velocity in, uh, pressure increases tremendously then again pressure drops and velocity increases this is what happens. So, across a certain distance forward and after the propeller the velocity keeps on increasing. Now, imagine the ship the ship is there and we have increased the velocity the ship is at the stern uh, sorry propeller is at the stern after the stern we have increased the velocity around the stern which is in fluid in front of the stern and pushing it forward. So, since the velocity is increasing the resistance of the ship in that condition increases which we have not tested because we never tested the ship for resistance with the propeller working and in fact, we cannot test it. We cannot test the resistance because as soon as the propeller works the ship provides the thrust therefore, our definition of resistance we cannot uh, measure as per the definition of resistance that is pulling the ship by a toro. So, what happens in this is that uh, the resistance increases to resistance increase to something like r dash from r where r dash is greater than r and we the propeller must provide thrust which should be equal to this r dash right t minus t should be equal to r dash. So, as if there is a augment on resistance and the augment being <coughs> equal to r dash minus r ok. In other words we can say as if there is a the thrust has to be deducted a, a, an amount of thrust must be deducted from the thrust generated T to equal resistance. Without with a resistance is always without propeller that is why I said r dash ok. So, this I can call that equal to delta t that is that augment of thrust that must be reduced from t to get r. So, t minus delta t is equal to r delta t or delta r let me write delta t. So, we can understand ok t minus delta t equal to r we can define a quantity small t which is equal to delta t by t which is equal to t minus r by t 1 minus r by t ok. This is called uh, this t is called thrust deduction fraction. Okay. So, now we had defined wake did we define wake I think we did not define wake we def, uh, we found out what is the physics of wake, but we did not define what is the quantity wake how do you determine what is the quantity wake we will come back to thrust reduction again. If we can measure the velocity all over the propeller disc we will have a three dimensional velocity field an axial component will be there that is along the axis of the prop, uh, propeller in the direction of the ship's axis. Another will be may be transverse may be vertical 
that is basically three dimensional flow or in polar coordinates we can say a velocity component in the tangential uh, direction at any point r tangential and another radial okay now normally this radial and tangential components can be ignored they are small in comparison to axial wake axial velocity so whenever we are defining wake normally we tell in terms of axial velocity field only that does not mean other velocities do not exist. That for convenience we consider axial velocity which is the major portion of the wave, major percentage of the total velocity field. That means in general you can appreciate that if the ship is moving this way water velocity also will be parallel in this axis mostly. Okay. So, when we have that we can uh, if I have the propeller and uh, at any circumferential direction, if I measure the velocity at various radii, that is various theta angles, axial velocities, then I can say the average if if v r theta is the velocity of water at any point r and theta, then velocity of the average velocity of water in that circumference, I can write V dash R equal to V R theta D theta divided by 2 pi from 0 to 2 pi at all theta as I integrate the velocity and take the this is basically taking average. Okay this is at one radius r. So, the overall wake over the whole propeller disc will be if I integrate this over r, am I right? So, that can be given as uh, 1 by pi r square minus root square. 0 to 2 pi and this is r b to r. Which is equal to Okay. We have found out this V dash R that integrated over the whole radius that is all we have done from the boss to the propeller T. Okay. So, this wake the wake due to this is defined as V by V this is called uh, nominal wake. and then speed of advance V A is equal to V minus wake is equal to 1 minus wake into V sorry minus V dash V bar. Velocity of advance this V bar will be reduced now, right, from the shift speed. So, that can be written as this. Have you understood? This way of determining wake can only be done if we know the velocity distribution in the entire propeller disk. We can integrate it over theta, then integrate it over r. So, this is only possible if we have the entire wake distribution on the propeller disc at various r and theta values then only we can calculate this. This can be done experimentally by removing the propeller fitting a pitot tube rake along the radially at various points the pressure holes will be there and we take the pressure readings on top get the pressure distribution at various r and theta values on the propeller disc and integrate and get the velocities. 
that is one way it is called a wake rake method of measuring wake, but this is not a uh, common practice is pretty involved it depends on having a wake rake and measurement device for the pressures and integration and all these things. What we otherwise do is can we not measure the velocity or find out the velocity uh, when the propeller is working behind the propeller uh, behind the ship. So, actually what we do is we run the propeller uh, and move the ship forward. The ship runs with its uh, with the ship uh, propellers uh, thrust and torque and uh, from there we calculate backwards thrust and torque we can measure RPM we know and we know the propeller characteristics because we have moved this propeller in open water before. So, then it is possible for us to estimate what would be the speed, what would be the average speed to give me this thrust and torque. Do, do you understand me? I am running the propeller moving the ship forward. So, I know the V s, I know the RPM at which propeller is moving, I am measuring the thrust and torque of the propeller. So, knowing the thrust and torque of the propeller, I know the resistance also. So, I know the thrust reduction fraction uh, and using this n, t and q, I can calculate k t and k q. Do you understand k t is t by rho n square d 4 and k q is t by rho n square d 5. And from there, I can go to j from the propeller open water diagram and get the V A. Understood? There is only one assumption here that the thrust and torque that I have measured would be the same thrust and torque at same speed and same RPM in propeller open water because I use the same diagram. Are you understanding me? On a model, <laughs> okay, let me explain again. I am measuring T, Q, N and shift speed V, right. So, this will give me K T equal to T by rho N square D 4, which I know. K Q is equal to Q by rho N square D 5, which I know, Q I have measured. Then I know K T and K Q. I know my propeller diagram, open water diagram. If I assume that the propeller is generating the same thrust and torque as in open water at the same RPM and speed, then I can enter the K T chart and get the J. This J is V A by N D. Therefore, V A is equal to J into N D. I can calculate my wake. Right? Is that correct? Good. One assumption only I have made that when I entered this chart, I assumed that the propeller open water characteristics and propeller behind characteristics are same. That immediately will note that it is not same because I have got KT, I have entered the chart with KT. What if I enter the chart with KQ? I should have actually got this value, this, but I will find that my KQ is not here, but somewhere here, which means that I am getting a different J and different wake. So, therefore, by this process I can get the wake, but it will be dependent on whether I assume thrust is same or torque is same. Do you understand? So, if thrust is same that is T 0 is equal to T B in open water and behind condition, if thrust is same, this means torque is not same and I get one wake. This is called wake by thrust identity, thrust is considered as identi identical. Okay. Similarly, if I take torque identity, which means T 0 is not equal to T b, 
and I get wake, this is called torque identity. Am I clear? Good. So, by running a ship model actually in the tank, by the process I have described how the model has to be scaled and other things. I can measure the thrust, torque, rpm and speed of the ship and propeller and therefore, get a wake value. This wake obtained in either of these methods is called the effective wake and it is different from the previous nominal wake which we had defined earlier. That means, the wake measured this way would be slightly different from if we measure the wake over the whole propeller disc without the propeller and calculated it. Because we know that when the propeller is there, the water speed is increased. So, there is a slight difference from the ideal condition if the propeller was not there. So, there will be a difference between the nominal wake and the effective wake. And the effective wake can be experimentally determined either by thrust identity or by torque identity. Clear? Okay. Now, this brings us to the third point that is the efficiency difference of the propeller between the behind condition and the uh, open condition that is called relative rotative efficiency eta r. What is the open water? Uh, what is the efficiency? We can define this like this eta b behind propeller efficiency, propeller in behind condition. What will be its efficiency? its efficiency, only the propeller efficiency. It will be T b into V a divided by 2 pi n Q b, right. Thrust power by torque power, this is how we have defined efficiency. Okay. Now, what is, how is T b and Q b related to T a 0 and Q 0? That is what we do not know. Propeller open water efficiency is right. So, the relative rotative efficiency, which is the ratio between eta b by eta o, right. That is the efficiency ratio between the behind condition and the open water condition. If I write this, what do I get? T b by T 0 into Q 0 by Q b. Am I right? Now, here again, we come across the same problem. We do not know both T b and Q b. So, we have to make some assumption. So, if we take thrust identity, I have already defined what it is T 0 equal to T b. Therefore, eta r is equal to Q 0 by Q b and torque identity Q 0 equal to Q b or eta r equal to T b by T 0. Sir, uh, how can the V a in the open water and uh, that is the same? You have taken it to be same. Sir, we know the uh, V a in open water, but we do not know exactly what is the V a in the You have just calculated, no? Mm -hmm. You have just calculated what is the V a by measuring wake. We have done that just now. The open order test must be done at that speed, not at shift speed. That is how the V A will be same. Do not confuse with the open order test being done at shift speed. No. The open order speed test is done at that speed V A, which you have calculated. You cannot do like that. So, what you do is you run the propeller at different speeds, open order characteristics. So, you get the J versus K T K Q diagram. That diagram you use for everything else. Automatically, 
the V A that you use for your behind condition will be the corresponding to the same V A. Okay. Right. So, we have got these three things that we have discussed now. Now, when you have a, we will use the reverse of these papers later on. Uh, When you have the engine is connected to the propeller by means of a propeller shaft. So, if I have a diesel engine, how do I know what is the power of the engine? I can measure the indicated pressure inside the cylinder and I can calculate the power which is called the indicated horsepower or IHP. And or I can do a brake test of a engine through a dynamometer and I can get the brake horsepower of BHP. That is the horsepower that is available to me at the crankshaft end where I am attaching my propeller shaft. Generally BHP is slightly less than IHP. What about a uh, steam turbine? I do not have a IHP, do I have a BHP? Normally what we get in a steam turbine not by brake test but by measuring the torsion on the shaft end. So, we get the torque on the shaft, we know the RPM. So, we get the power which is called the shaft horsepower SHP. So, in a steam turbine we get SHP and in a diesel turbine we get BHP. A diesel turbine is no, a diesel engine is normally a constant torque machine. So, if the RPM drops the power also drops. If there is a reduction of RPM, then engine power also drops because within that range the torque should remain constant. On the other hand, a steam turbine or a gas turbine, if the RPM drops, what happens? It is a constant power increase machine, therefore, the torque can be increased to maintain the constant power. The torque of a turbine based shafting system can be increased at a reduced RPM, so that your power become remains constant. So, turbines are generally called constant power machines. So, at the engine end we can measure the torsion in a turbine ship or the brake horse power of an engine and the relationship between RPM and uh, power. I can also, if I have a torsion meter mounted anywhere on the shaft, I can also measure the power at any intermediate position on the propeller shaft. I can also measure the thrust by some amount of uh, strain gauging or uh, fixing instruments on the shaft. I can get the thrust and torque at any point. Now, the power that is delivered at the engine end is reduced slightly as it comes to the propeller end that is the power that is available at the forward end of the propeller is called the delivered horsepower or simply DHP. This DHP is less than BHP of a diesel engine or SHP of a steam turbine. Why is it less? There are few losses because of the gearbox the thrust block, the other bearings that may be supporting the shaft and finally, the stern gland. Okay. Now, normally the engines are uh, aft nowadays, most of the ships have aft engines and if it is a direct drive system, you can easily assume a 2 to 3 percent power loss because of the these items I have mentioned. On the other hand, if it is a gear drive, then the power loss will be more ranging between 4 percent to 8 percent, depending on whether the engine is extreme aft or it is moved forward like in naval vessels. So, if we reduce this amount, we can easily know what is the DHP available at the propeller end. This is at that RPM, we can also calculate the torque. 
So, that is the torque available to the propeller at that rpm with that forward speed. And if we know the resistance, if you know the characteristics of propellers, we can calculate weight, thrust expansion, etcetera. So, we can say dHp or Pd is equal to 2 pi n q, q we are measuring on the shaft. So, we can get uh, the dHp. Thrust power, what is thrust power? T into V a, right. And effective power R T into V, V, yes, it is V, V S, ship speed. Please recall, we had defined this before. So, now the drop in speed uh, power from P B that is B H P to D H P is defined by an efficiency called shafting efficiency. Is equal to B H P by D H P which we have seen can vary from 2 to 8 percent depending on gear drive or non gear drive aft engine or slightly midship engine or whatever. The other efficiency between P D to P E, if I define the efficiency, I call that as Q P C or quasi propulsive efficiency, which is equal to P E by P D. That is, if this is my output required, this is my input to the propeller, then the efficiency is the ratio between output by input P E by P D. We will see in the next hour how this can be broken up into components and how we can utilize it. We will stop here. Thank you. I thought I can finish it. No, I could not finish it. Sorry. Sorry about that. aspiring to find ways to fulfill a dream lays the foundation of an institution that will give aspiring technocrats the license to fly high. The first Indian Institute of Technology is born at Kharagpur. Founded on the basis of the recommendations of the NR Sarkar Committee that was set up in 1945 to consider the development of higher technical institutions in India, the institute was first established in 5 Esplanade East, Kolkata, before it moved to Kharagpur in 1951. With Sir Gyan Chandra Ghosh as the first director and Dr. B.C. Roy as one of its founding guardians, the institute established itself as the symbol of a young, dynamic and resurgent nation. As top students rub shoulders with the most celebrated of professors and scholars, visions took shape. And IIT Kharagpur continued to play the pioneering role that was envisaged for it, enabling India to become a knowledge powerhouse that it is today. At every stage of its evolution, IIT Kharagpur remained ahead of its times. It provided the best of facilities for the budding technologists 
helping them shape their own as well as the nation's future. Indeed, today IIT Kharagpur has blossomed into a time-tested, venerable institute of learning. With the rich experience of converting individuals into brilliant professionals through 50 glorious years. As you cross the campus gate, you feel the distinct nip that is IIT Kharagpur. The spirit of objective inquiry and lateral thinking hangs heavy in the air. The modern township-like campus of IIT Kharagpur set in sylvan surroundings is self-sufficient in all respects. From modern banks to the good old post office, from vast playgrounds and well-equipped gyms to modern auditoria and open-air theatres, and from the quiet fibre-optic-linked residential quarters for the faculty to the web-enabled hostel rooms for the students. At IIT Kharagpur, lush green bowers of tranquility coexist with smart cards and ATMs. Spread over 690 hectares of sprawling cyber habitat, 120 kilometers from Kolkata, IIT Kharagpur is one of the largest network campuses in Asia. Just the academic complexes itself spreads over a built-up area of about 2 million square feet, of which 150,000 square feet is the new complex that commemorates the Golden Jubilee celebrations. And that's not all. It is the only IIT to have conquered territory beyond its own. This technology and medical sciences the Institute has revolutionized and popularized rice milling technology. The other major contributions of IIT Kharagpur have been in the critical fields of defense, railways, space research, power systems and petrochemicals. All these activities directly empower the human requirements of the nation. Advanced facilities at the Institute make it possible to undertake cutting-edge research and service-sponsored research projects. The array of equipment ranges from aerodynamic testing laboratories to intelligent machining centers, atomic spectrometers, to VLSI design labs, molecular beam epitaxy, to anechoic chamber, fast protein liquid chromatographs to liquid nitrogen plants. Cutting-edge technologies are at par with the best research facilities across the globe. In fact, the volume of research and development activities at the Institute is incredible. In terms of the number of patents it owns, the volume of industrial consultancy it provides and the revenue that it earns from all these make IIT Kharagpur a class apart and strengthens its position as the true pioneer in technological education in India. The Institute Library deserves a special mention. Fully web-enabled, it is one of the largest in Asia with over 324,000 volumes of material, including books, videos, microfilm, and patent documents. that ensure a student's mind develops at the right pace. Along 
with its strong sense of academics, which is ensured by a strict selection process, life at Kharagpur is a celebration of, well, life. And at its heart are the students. In fact, the saying goes that you can take an IITN out of KGP, but not KGP out of an IITN. You've left a part of you behind. For most of the students, life in the campus was in itself a festivity, a collage of activities that shape their mind and body. In areas ranging from vehicle structure design to electrical communication and software technologies are excellent examples of IIT Kharagpur's ever-evolving pioneering spirit. Collaborations with a host of national and industrial majors are a testimony of its proven expertise and research repertoire. celebration continues, Pandit Nehru would surely have been a proud man today. For him, IIT Kharagpur was always more than just an institute of technology. In his own immortal words, it is indeed a fine monument of modern India. <laughs> 